and let's see if it's afternoon here in Ontario, then it's it's uh, still afternoon in BC, and it's kind of early evening in the east. So, if if you are in the evening, good evening. And uh, we will take some time. We've got a very large group today, so we'll uh, give some time for people to come in. It's uh, just one minute past the hour now. And we'll probably do another two or three minutes and then get started. And it's always informal here, as everybody knows, so we don't have a problem. And Michelle, are you putting your hand up or were you just... <laughs> no, okay, good. <laughs> Stretching. And, and I will say now to, to those of you that are on now that uh, if you have any questions, we would ask you to ask them in the chat. If you're unfamiliar with Zoom, which I find nobody is anymore, everybody knows Zoom really well, then you go to the bottom. When you move your cursor, you'll get a, a uh, toolbar down at the bottom and there's a word chat there. And when you click chat, that'll open up and you can type and everybody sees what you ask. And um, Jackie's asked me to keep an eye on that and interrupt her when I feel like it and uh, and uh, ask her the questions for you on your behalf. And uh, we'll try and get to as many as we can. And it's quite often when the groups are this large, uh, we get too many questions. And if that's the case, uh, we'll try and get back to the entire group when uh, we do, when we send you a recording of this, uh, we can always uh, give you answers to things we didn't get to, right, Jackie? Absolutely, <laughs> right. absolutely. Okay, and uh, let's see, where are we? We're at 87 in so far. We had, what, what did the NA say, NAs? What did you tell us? How many people are signed up for this? 174 or something? 194. 194. That's amazing. That's our largest by far, Jack. You're a very popular woman. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very popular. Thank yes, you. Yes, that's right. So that's good. So um, please, everybody, bear with us for another minute or two as uh, people continue to come in. I just came away from a, a dinner last night in Prince, Prince Edward County, Ontario uh, at Carlo Estates. They hosted an Opimian dinner. Uh, we're still not ready to host dinners ourselves at Opimian with the COVID risk, but we have allowed um, uh, wineries that are willing to do so and they do all the booking and everything. And uh, so they booked us. We had about 50 people out last night and uh, and we, we followed all the protocols, I can assure everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I got home last night, so that, that worked out very well. So looking forward to having being able to do those more. But we'll continue to do these virtual ones. I mean, they've turned out to be very, very good, very engaging. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done lots, and we get, as you can see today, we've gotten so many people uh, who are interested. And uh, It's a great format. Yes. Yeah, and so we're almost at uh, almost at 100 Jackie, I think I'll wait one more minute and then we'll get okay. started. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And let people. And uh, it's great to see some very familiar names. In fact, some names that I saw those people last night <laughs> in Prince Edward County. So that's great. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. We really, really appreciate that. And that's what I find wonderful about Opinion is that uh, we can share the joy of wine together and we get together on things like this and uh, dinners together. And we've got some travel happening in the new year and uh, and it's always great to get together mm -hmm. over the joy of wine. So it's really neat. All right, well, Anais, I think I've waited long enough as I'm yes. impatient as I'm sure everybody else is too. They wanna to get started. So I, I, I was joking with Jackie, but I'm gonna say it out loud to all of you that this is the Jackie Blisson show. So nobody wants to listen to me. <laughs> of course and, they do, uh, Michael. So, so, and, and I was, I deliberately, you know, I was going to do some reading about Abruzzo uh, before this, because I don't know very much about it. And I thought, that's crazy. I'm going to be listening to Jackie, four. one of only 10 masters of wine in, uh, in Canada is going to be talking about it. So I'm getting it from one of the most, uh, the, the most knowledgeable people in the mm -hmm. world about this. So why would I go and do my own reading? So without further ado, I will introduce Jackie Blisson, master of wine and over to you, Jackie. Hello, thank you so much everybody for joining. I am just thrilled to have so many of you uh, give up a part of your Saturday uh, midday, afternoon, evening to be here with us today. Uh, when I reached out to Michael and uh, shared this opportunity, I was approached by the Consorzio uh, of Vini d'Abruzzo. So the marketing body, essentially the association of growers of the region. And they said, hey, we'd love to do some educational events all around Canada about our wines, about our region. And uh, I reached out to Michael and he said, yeah, I think my members would love that. 
and you have a lovely Montepulciano d'Abruzzo in your range. Uh, so we thought this would just tie in really nicely. So as Michael said, we're going to keep this super informal. Um, we're going to talk about the wines, the food, the culture of Abruzzo. I'm going to share a little bit of a little presentation, but it's mostly going to be pictures, a small video, as you said, Saturday afternoon. I'm not going to tax anybody's brain too much on this. Um, we're going to ask for questions in the chat. And if you are not talking, if you could just mute your mic and just make it easier for everybody else to hear. So Barry, and, and if you don't second. mute your mic, then Anaïs is going to mute you from Montreal. So uh -huh, uh -oh. that's uh -oh. right. One second here while I put that full screen. So just a couple of words, first of all, from Abruzzo, from the sponsor. Uh, all of these wonderful wine regions around Europe uh, are looking, obviously, to sell their wines locally, but also to sell their wines abroad. And, you know, it's, it is difficult to be able to travel, especially at the it's moment, um, and to be able to really share the gospel about their fine wines. And they enjoy uh, subsidies from the European Union to allow them to have the budget to do these kinds of activities. And so what Abruzzo did is they got together with um, different wine regions around Europe and some fruit regions as well, the sweet wines of Bordeaux and uh, the regions of Greece that make kiwis and cherries and said, let's set up a campaign together, the charming taste of Europe. And that way we will be able to um, run a campaign together, uh, support each other and really spread educational mandates about our products all over the world. So just a couple of words on the charming taste of Europe. If you want to learn more about the delicious sweet wines of Bordeaux, obviously, so Terran style wines, um, or about the fruits and the, the kiwis and the cherries from Greece, the charming taste of Europe is the name of their campaign to really promote and to spread the love on these wines, especially in Canada and the USA. So we're going to dive right into it. Uh, we are talking today about Abruzzo. Abruzzo, I love to put this map up of Italy because uh, it's a fun little wine map of Italy. But you see right off the bat that Tuscany and Piedmont are written in big, big letters, you know, bottles of wine there. Uh, you really get a sense of these being wine regions. Uh, but Abruzzo and many other of the wine regions, because essentially they're producing wine all over Italy. Um, you really don't get any sense from a map like this, that this is a wine region. Piedmont and Tuscany have historically, these are areas with wealth. Uh, Piedmont has the town of Turin, Tuscany, Florence. Um, so they had wealthy backers uh, and were able to sort of spread the gospel of their wines far further earlier on than a region like Abruzzo. But Abruzzo is really fascinating for its wines and it's undergone a serious quality revolution in the last 20 years or so. So I really think it is worth sort of taking some time and learning about it and you know, getting off the beaten track and not always drinking the same Chianti's and, um, and Nebbiolo's from Piedmont that we're, that we're used to, you know, trying something a little bit different. Um, so give you a little bit of background on Italy in general in terms of wine production. So there's a sort of rivalry every year between Italy and France on which country in the world has the highest wine production. Uh, Italy is often number one. Um, and Italy actually has over 350 different wine grapes officially registered uh, on a national level as wine producing grapes, but there's said to be over 500 wine grapes in existence in the country. A lot of these are indigenous grapes that are little grown outside of the country, but just a huge, huge diversity coming out of Italy. And when you compare that uh, with France, for example, France has about 60 grapes that are making the vast majority of its wine. So really a huge diversity, not only a huge diversity of grapes, but a huge diversity of terroirs. Uh, you have the Apennine Mountains is a chain of mountains that runs all the way down the center of Italy and provides quite a mountainous interior. You obviously have coastlines on both sides going the whole way down the country. Um, and so this provides a huge uh, series of microclimates, uh, of alt altitudes, orientations, expositions, microclimates that really allows a diversity of wine to be produced. Uh, if we look specifically 
at Abruzzo. This is an Italian region that's about 100 kilometers east of Rome. So you land in Rome uh, and it's about a two hour drive, but it's extremely, extremely mountainous. This is potentially one of the reasons that it's lesser known. It's really historically wasn't that accessible because of this mountain. It's about 65% of the landmass of Abruzzo is mountains. Here, the Apennines, which I said, are this mountain chain that's sort of the spinal column of Italy. Here, uh, we're at the highest peak of the Apennines, uh, the Gran Sasso d'Italia chain, and its highest peak, the Corno Grande, is almost at 3,000 meters in altitude, and this is located here in Abruzzo. So from these Apennine mountain chains, you go, to, there's a gradual slope down to these Adriatic coast. So this is a pretty wild area. This is just a shot of the interior um, with a, a, a chapel. And it's really, you get a sense when you're there of this sort of wild, unspoilt area. They're really fantastic, fabulous hikes uh, walking tours to be done all around this area. And I'll talk about the gastronomy and the, the food culture a little bit later on, but you can really, I mean, two hours from Rome, have a fantastic holiday here. If you are into walking and eating and trying the wines, it's really, I highly recommend it. Um, so you see this rugged mountainous interior, the abundance of national parks and national reserves. It's actually considered to be one of the greenest areas in Italy. Uh, in the interior here, you have quite a continental climate, fairly humid at the top uh, area of the mountains. And then as you're sloping down towards the Adriatic coast, that's where you're going to get into a warmer Mediterranean climate. Um, so a lot of these hilltop villages, I'm going to show you a picture here, uh, are uh, date back to medieval or Renaissance periods, and they're sort of dotted along this mountainous landscape. The capital is called Aquila, and you might remember the name Aquila because it was the site in 2009 of quite a terrible earthquake um, whose aftershocks, I think there were something like over a thousand aftershocks for a period of months, and this beautiful medieval town that was just reduced to rubble. A lot of people unfortunately lost their lives, and it took a number of years before people were allowed to return in the town, and it's just slowly still being rebuilt, which is quite a loss um, in terms of the, uh, the patrimony of this area is a really beautiful historical town. Another importance of this, of this town of Aquila is this is also where winemaking first, first originated uh, in the area. So a lot of history around here. Getting back to Abruzzo in general, we've got a population of about just over a million people living here and it's a largely agricultural area, um, some fishing on the coast. I'm going to show you uh, just a little, I love to show little videos uh, in these seminars because I think it just sort of breaks things up and you can sort of get a sense of living vicariously, traveling vicariously to the region. So I'm just going to show a little snapshot from this video by the consortio and then we'll, we'll jump back in. Two thousand years ago, in the heart of Pelinia Valley in Abruzzo, members of the Italic League made Corfinium the first Italian capital. At that time, the Roman poet Ovid already wrote about the fertility of the land and its vocation for vine cultivation. Over the centuries, the cultivation of native Abruzzo vines has spread from the Pelinia Valley to the hills regions close to the coast, which present ideal conditions to produce fine grapes, which then are carefully transformed into grape wines. Abruzzo region has a natural vocation for the cultivation of vines. The presence of the Gran Sasso and Maiella Mountains, a short distance from the Adriatic Sea, generate strong temperature variations between day and night that combine with good ventilation provide an ideal microclimate to produce grapes of extraordinary quality. Vineyards are trained on traditional trellis systems called Hinduni Abruzzese, which is typical of the region, as well as on vertical trellis systems. In 1968, Monte Bucciano d'Abruzzo wine was recognized 
with a controlled designation of origin. Vineyards in Abruzzo cover approximately 32,000 hectares of land with an average annual production of about 3.5 million wine hectoliters. The most widespread varieties are Monte Pociano, cultivated on 17,000 hectares, and Trebbiano, cultivated on over 12,000 hectares of land. Other indigenous vine varieties, such as Pecorino, Passarina, Cococciola, and Montonico, have increasingly become popular in the market. Germans, while we think, Monte Pociano de Bruzzo, which accounts for more than half of regional production and is now universally recognized as one of the great Italian reds. Also much appreciated is its rosé interpretation, the Cerasualo de Bruzzo. Noteworthy among the whites are Trebbiano de Bruzzo, which yields both pleasant young wines and wines of extraordinary longevity. The Pecorino, a high quality wine with enhanced fruit and bouquet. And finally, the Pasolina, Cococciola, and Montonico, still wines that complete the Abruzzo family of great wines. The Consortium for the Protection of Wines of Abruzzo is a voluntary nonprofit association whose members are wine growers, wine makers, and authorized bottlers. There are currently eight typical geographical indications, eight controlled designations of origin, and a controlled and guaranteed designation of origin to certify the quality of Abruzzo wines. The supervision of the consortium is performed at both the technical level to verify the producer's compliance with regulations and at the administrative level to ensure the protection of labels from plagiarism, unfair competition, piracy, and other offenses. It is a system of protection and development that guarantees the quality of Abruzzo wines for the consumer. Wines of Abruzzo discover the flavors of a unique territory. Sure. Just get to the next slide. So that just gives you an overview. I love to show those kind of videos. Uh, obviously, there's a a commercial side at the end, but it just gives you a sense of seeing it for yourself, the region, those mountain tops that I was uh, referring to. Here we are. Um, and we're just going to delve into that in a little bit more, uh, more detail. So that video was made a few years ago. So they're actually up to 36,000 hectares of vines now. Um, as you can see, these are the regions of Abruzzo on this map here, and it's, uh, it's separated into four provinces. And it's this area that you see sort of right in the middle of the map, Chieti, and the surrounding area where we really have a large production of wine. Here, we're in the lower lying area, we're close to the coast, we have warm Mediterranean conditions that really help the vine thrive. So the video mentioned three major uh, wine styles and a few major grapes. And we're just gonna delve into those. Montepulciano, the name of the major appellation, but it's also the name of the major grape. This is a red grape variety that's native to the area and roughly half of all the planting, 17,000 hectares of 36,000 are of Montepulciano. And this is a really ancient grape variety in Italy. It's the fifth most planted red grape. And for a long time, it was confused with Sangiovese. And it was only when they did DNA profiling that they really determined that Montepulciano was its own grape. Some might confuse it. In Tuscany, there is a town called Montepulciano uh, and a wine called Vino Nobili de Montepulciano. But that is actually made with Sangiovese. It is a completely different 
wine. It's a bit confusing, but has nothing to do with Abruzzo and with this grape variety, which is Montepulciano. So this grape really needs a warm climate. It needs a long growing season to fully ripen. It's a thick, thick skin grape and the pigments, as you know, are found in the grape skin and thicker skin grapes like this one tend to give quite deep colored wines. So Montepulciano is deeply colored. It's got lovely earthy, peppery, quite savory, gamey notes to it, as well as uh, some very ripe dark fruit. And uh, it's very uh, sort of a easy drinking red, I would say on the palate because it's fresh without being bitingly acidic. It's medium bodied for the most part uh, and it's got moderate tannins. Depending on the site, there's some higher uh, in Pescara and Terame, which are regions a little bit further north on the coast that are a little higher in altitude. There are some plantings that make much fuller bodied styles of Montepulciano that are longer lived and really age worthy, but for the most part, it tends to be a more medium bodied, really approachable wine. And it's really a great uh, quaffing wine, really great to enjoy with a pizza, for example. And in Abruzzo, it is famously paired with the local lamb, which is a real delicacy there, as well as a lot of the cured meats that they make. Um, and for festive occasions, they have a suckling pig that they turn on a spit and this is really the wine that they would bring out the best of the Montepulciano wines to have with this, with this festive delicacy. The second grape that's really important in the area is the Trebbiano. Trebbiano is actually, so it's a white variety, but it isn't a single variety. It's a little bit confusing. It's actually a family of grape varieties. And there's quite a few different uh, iterations planted all over Italy. Trebbiano sometimes gets a bad rap as uh, making fairly neutral white wines, uh, but the version that the variant of the grape that exists in Abruzzo, which is called Trebbiano d'Abruzzo, is really considered by a lot of Italian wine experts to be the best expression of Trebbiano. Slightly more intense in terms of its aromatic, a lot of stone fruit, in warmer climates verging on peachy type notes, uh, quite light in body, but rounded with lovely sort of bitter almond notes on the finish that give it this really refreshing bitterness. A lot of people, when you mention bitterness on a wine, they sort of think this must be a negative thing, but very, very subtle bitterness can be actually be quite refreshing um, and really make a wine very uh, food friendly, really good for food pairings. And that is definitely the case with the Trebbiano d'Abruzzo. It's generally, as I said, produced in quite an easy drinking style. It's, you know, quaffed at the trattorias by, by the side of uh, the Adriatic coast with lovely fish dishes and salads. But there are also producers who are really starting to make some quite serious age-worthy Trebbianos, much lower yields, making much more concentrated wines. And um, Eduardo Valentini, for example, is a producer who's really shown, he has a cult Trebbiano d'Abruzzo, which I think retails for something like $500 or more, but he's really shown with the Trebbiano that you can make uh, a wooded style that is really age worthy and long lived. And I think his wines, you can keep them for 15, 20 years or more, and they really have quite a serious following. So a grape that can go from an everyday white to quite a serious white as well. There's also a second white grape that isn't as highly planted. So the Montepulciano, as I said, over half the plantings, the Trebbiano, almost 40%. So those two grapes alone really cover the vast majority of the territory here. But there's a few other indigenous grapes that are starting to gain in popularity. And one of the major ones is Pecorino. So not to be confused with the cheese of the same name, which also comes from the region, Pecorino as a grape was actually named after um, the shepherds that would eat the grapes. The word for sheep in Italian in the region is pecora. And uh, apparently they were such flavorful, juicy grapes that the shepherds while minding their flocks uh, near the vineyards would eat vast quantities of them and they called the grape pecorino. So this is a white variety. Uh, and it really makes lovely, racy, crisp white wines that have surprising body and richness and texture to them. It's made in the regions north of Abruzzo, the Marque, as well as Abruzzo and to the south Molise, and is really starting to gain a lot of traction as sort of a, the next 
big thing in terms of Italian white grapes pecorino. So that's sort of a, a rising star in Abruzzo. So when you think about the Appalachians, and this is something that in France, uh, they use the term AOC, in uh, Spain, DO or DOC. Here in Italy, we talk about DOCs, denominations of origin, which are controlled, and DOCG. So this is the top tier in the pyramid. These are sort of singled out in all the different regions of Italy as being the very best of the Appalachian wines. So in Abruzzo, there are two of these DOCGs, but very, very small production. We don't tend to see as many of them leaving the country. Uh, the most popular, the main Appalachian wine in Abruzzo is Montepulciano d'Abruzzo. Very easy as it sounds. It is the Montepulciano grape of Abruzzo, and it can be made pretty much throughout the region of uh, the four different provinces of Abruzzo, but obviously a large production, as I said, around this southern coastal area of Chieti. You can see on this picture here, you got vines that are just going down the slopes gently, looking out over the Adriatic Sea. So a pretty stunning location to be making these wines. So these Montepulciano d'Abruzzo wines, as I said, they are really um, savory, but at the same time fruity with little uh, spicy or peppery notes to them and really quite uh, approachable on the palate due to this moderate acidity, medium body and moderate tannins. There's nothing aggressive or, over or overwhelming on these wines. They tend to be made uh, uh, unoaked or in large neutral vessels called botti or foudre in France. Uh, and they tend to use Slavonian oak. So you often hear about French oak, American oak, um, this is actually not to be con confused with Slovenia, Slavonian oak, as oak that is sourced from an area of Croatia. And it's very popular, it's traditional in Italy to use this oak. And it doesn't actually impart a whole lot of flavor or aroma to the wine. It really is used just to round out the wines and make them a little bit more supple, round out their tannins uh, and soften them a little bit. So traditionally, as I said, either unoaked or using these neutral vessels to make these wines. And there's also within Montepulciano d'Abruzzo, a reserva level. And at this reserva level, this is where there's an obligation to oak age. Two years before you can uh, sell the wine. And in those two years, there has to be at least nine months in oak. So the reserva tier tends to be the more age worthy, fuller bodied, more structured style of Montepulciano. If you're looking for a more premium Montepulciano, you would get the Reserva. When it comes to Trebbiano, it's the same thing. The uh, appellation, the DOC is called Trebbiano d'Abruzzo. And here again, uh, you have your basic tier, which tends to be fermented in stainless steel, very short aging period. And you're really just looking to make a, a crisp, light, smooth wine that's for everyday quaffing. But as I mentioned, there are some producers out there who are really showing that this can be an age-worthy, structured, serious wine. And so here we have two upper tiers. We have a superior tier, which has to be aged for two or three months longer, but there's no obligation to oak age it in any way. And then there's also a reserva here as well. And that's aged for at least six months. And there generally is a little bit of oak aging involved. Uh, and finally, the style that they mentioned in the video that we haven't discussed yet is called Cerasuolo d'Abruzzo. And this is made with a Montepulciano grape, but into a rosé style instead of a red, a dry rosé, which in Italy is called rosato. And uh, I was pouring this wine for an Abruzzo event that I did a earlier in the week. And it's quite a deep colored rosé. As I mentioned, Montepulciano is a grape that has quite thick skins. It's a heavily pigmented grape. And so the rosé itself is quite deep in color. And right away, I could tell people their face was sort of falling when I was pouring this wine. And I said, do you think that because it's deeper in color, it's going to be sweet? And I asked for a show of hands and almost everybody raised their hands because a lot of people have gotten it into their minds now that pale rosé is dry and higher in quality. And deeper rosé is sort of commercial, sweeter, uh, not as high quality rosé. And that's not necessarily the case. If you think about 
this region and this wine that we're going to talk about, or if you think about Tavel, for example, in the Southern Rhone Valley, there are a lot of deeper colored rosés that are high, high quality. And I'm going to explain the process that it'll all make sense, a little bit more sense. So making a rosé wine, essentially you're using red grapes and you are just leaving them in contact with the skins where the pigments are for a, a set period of time, depending on the winemaker's decision. Uh, and then you're pressing and you're fermenting just the pulp, the way you would a white wine. Uh, and the, depending on how long you leave these grapes in contact with their skins, the color will be deeper. And obviously it also depends on the grape variety because certain are more pigmented than others. This wine is left for only four to six hours, which is actually the same amount of time that the grapes of Provence, like Grenache, saint so Syrah, uh, are left in contact before they're pressed and fermented. But because Montepulciano is, as I said, a thicker skinned grape, deeply pigmented, it just gives a much more deeply colored wine. The aroma precursors and flavors are also found in the grape skins. And so you get a lot of, the longer you macerate, the more aromas and the more flavor you're also getting. And you can also get a slight tannic sensation, nothing as compared to a red wine, but just a sort of a slight uh, sense of astringency, which can be quite attractive on a dry rosé and really make it more food friendly. So Cerasuolo, Cerasuolo, if I'm pronouncing it properly in Italian, excuse any Italians listening for my terrible accent, uh, actually means cherry. And the grape is, uh, the wine is named this because of this deeper color. And they're really, really interesting rosés. As I mentioned, they're dry, but they're fairly, they're fairly full bodied and they have lovely aromas of orange peel and cinnamon and strawberry and dry cherry. There aren't a whole load of them in Canada, unfortunately at the moment, but if you come across one, I definitely encourage you to try you know, switch it up a little bit with these very pale, these lovely pale rosés that are great for quaffing in the summertime. If you're looking for a rosé that would be more of a food wine, that's a great compromise between a white wine and a red wine. Let's say you're eating in a restaurant and one person's having fish and the other person's having a light meat. This would be a great compromise between a white and a red wine. So Terrasuolo d'Abruzzo, definitely worth looking out for. Yeah, it doesn't always have to be Pinot Noir, does it, Jackie? It doesn't always have to be Pinot Noir because we do tend to say that easily when people say, oh, I'm going to have salmon and my husband's going to have steak, which we get. And you go right to light red, but you can go for a fuller bodied rosé. They really do tend to work well. And this one's so interesting because it's got lovely fruit, but it's got these sort of bright, tangy citrus notes, a bit of spice. So it's really got a lot of interest on the nose. And it's really an intriguing, an intriguing wine that's definitely worth trying. A mm. uh, couple, couple of questions for you, Jackie. Absolutely. Uh, um, are yeah. any of the wines from Abruzzo uh, vegan? That might be an unfair question. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, so there, yes, absolutely. More and more so because it's becoming, I have to say internationally, you're going to find that more and more wines in general are vegan because it's really becoming a bit of a prerequisite for export to a lot of markets to have at least some wines in a range be vegan. So when we're talking about a wine being vegan, uh, it essentially it's just a question of how the wine is clarified before it's bottled, uh, a process called fining. Um, so it's essentially adding an agent to the wine that's going to attach itself to any remaining sediment in the bottle and then it's sort of filtered out. Um, and these fining agents that were traditionally used in many regions had some egg or had some gelatin or some albumin or things that are, you know, meat derived in them. So not suitable for vegans, but more and more producers are using clay, uh, a form of clay uh, called bentonite to do their fining if they're fining at all. And so, and this is increasingly the case in uh, Abruzzo as well. And for the most part, you'll see on the back label suitable for vegans. And that's how you'll know. Exactly. And that's for Patricia. I hope that answers your question, Patricia. In fact, you've already said it has. And uh, Sandy is asking, uh, could you spell the name of that rosé you were speaking of? Yes, about? yes, it is a tricky one. So it's C-E-R-A-S-U-O-L-O. -O -O. Maybe, Annie, if you could write that in the chat. C-E-R-A-S-U-O-L-O. -O. D'Abruzzo. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jackie. Ooh, before I get into all this yummy food stuff, mm -hmm. I'm just going to finish up on the, on the wine. Uh, so 
really interesting area. But there's a history of small growers here. As I said, we're in a rugged, mountainous area, really small villages, small communities, and it, there weren't huge tracts of vineyards here. There's just lots and lots of little plots. So lots of the history of families owning small plots of vines, but essentially owning polycultures. So they would have some grape vines, but they would also have you know, uh, orchards, they would have olive groves, um, they would have some animals, and it was sort of subsistence farming. Uh, and so most of these, when some of them decided that, you know, these grapes, they had potentially more than they could make into wine just for their family, uh, but they didn't necessarily have the means or the time to be building a winery and making, you know, commercial scale wines. Uh, they would take them to the local cooperatives. And the area really got built up on the idea of each town, each commune having its cooperative cellar where all the villagers would come, bring their grapes and make sort of one common cuvee. And so for a long time, these cooperatives sort of gained in size, gained in power, and the region became known for making cooperative wines, which sadly for a period of time um, gave it a bit of a poor reputation. The area was also really hard hit during the Second World War. There was, you know, not a lot of labor. There was labor shortages after the Second World War. There was a lot of poverty after the Second World War. And so um, those with vineyards were really, Montepulciano can be quite a vigorous grape. And so they were really pushing uh, yields to quite high levels to make more wine to sell to, and the cooperatives would be selling them to the local trattorias and to the Roman trattorias as well in the neighboring areas. And so they got a reputation, unfortunately, for selling these high volumes of, you know, fairly mediocre wine. And that was another thing that sort of stopped Montepulciano, stopped Abruzzo from really uh, gaining the reputation that potentially it deserved prior to this time. But happily, in the last sort of 30 years, and I'd say especially in the last 15, there's been a real turnaround, there's been a real move to show that Montepulciano and Trebbiano can be very, very serious grapes when they're grown, you know, when they're treated with care, when they're grown in lower yielding uh, techniques, in better sites. And there was really two leaders to this. There was uh, a winemaker called Emilio Pepe and another called Eduardo Valentini, who were sort of two pioneers, one in Terraman and one in Pescara. And they both had um, sites in the foothills of the Apennines that had great exposure, really sun-drenched exposure, limestone and clay soils. And they decided, OK, we're going to bring the yields way down. We're going to really try. They had older vines and older vines produce less quantity anyway uh, and make a much more concentrated style of wine. So they really decided to start making serious, very age-worthy premium wines. And slowly by slowly, their wine started selling and you know, the word got out in the local community and then in the Italian press and then in the international press. And I started turning towards Abruzzo and interest came back for, the, especially for the Montepulciano. Uh, grape variety. And this sort of uh, phenomenon trickled down first to other family growers who decided to start, you know, bottling their own wines and really aiming higher, aspiring to making these more qualitative wines, and also to the cooperatives who in the last 20 years have become far more dynamic. There's far less, yes, they still make everyday wines, that are great quaffing wines, but even at the everyday level, they're really, really trying to show that they're making good really rounded, approachable, fruity, pleasing wines, and then also aiming to have a mid-tier and a higher tier of more age-worthy structured wines as well. The happy thing for us as consumers is that the prices have not caught up with this quality revolution yet. And so they really remain very affordable wines from Italy. Um, you can find a lot of these uh, whites and roses and reds in the sort of 15 to $30 range. Uh, you have lovely, really lovely quaffing wines. And then the top tier wines, there's only one or two producers whose wines are sort of over $100, uh, cult wines, as I said. But for, for the most part, you can get even some pretty age-worthy, pretty spectacular wines that 10 years later you take out of your cellar and you are more than happy to drink, you know, at the, at the $30 to $50 range. So huge, huge value still coming out of Abruzzo uh, from Montepulciano 
from Trebbiano and increasingly from the Pecorino grape. So we're going to also talk a little bit about the food because I love talking about food as much as I love talking about wine and then food and wine pairing, of course, it's always like nice to know what kind of meals go best with these wines and obviously the easiest and the most logical pairings for any wines are the foods of the region. So this is really, I mean, there is an abundance of amazing uh, foods uh, being made here. Huge, huge, huge diversity all over from the mountainous areas to the coastline, from the continental climate to this Mediterranean climate. Uh, huge diversity in soils as well, from very fertile areas to more rocky areas. So it really supports a wide diversity of different agriculture. Olive oil, as in much of Italy, is a huge, uh, a hugely important product here. And there's actually three different protected origins for olive oil within Abruzzo. Lentils as well. Lentils, uh, especially in a mountainous area called Santo Stefano de Sassiano. And these are really, really small, brown, very, very flavorful, savory style of lentils that you actually don't need to soak at all before using. You can just boil them immediately and they have a very soft, almost creamy texture to them. And they're really sought after with chefs in Italy. And um, up on the top left there, you see saffron. And the saffron of the area is also uh, hugely sought after. Uh, and it has apparently really, really quite a fragrant style of saffron. Uh, another thing that I didn't have a picture of here, but is actually a great story, is their red garlic. So when you look at it with its, uh, with its skin on, it looks like a regular bulb of garlic. It's got the white sort of what they would call in France and chemise. And when you take it off, it's actually red, really bright red on the inside. And this uh, red garlic from Solmona in the southern part of Abruzzo is actually sought after not only for its taste, chefs coming because it's got quite a delicate taste and apparently no bitterness whatsoever, but also for its curative properties. So I don't know if any of you out there have ever used garlic in a remedy with sort of lemon and hot water and things like that against a cold, but garlic actually has a lot of uh, antibiotic properties. I'm just looking up the word here, allostatin is the name of the natural antibiotic property within garlic. And apparently this red garlic from Abruzzo has the highest content of this allostatin of all the garlics in Italy or apparently in the world. And uh, so it's used quite uh, widely in the area as a cold and flu remedy. I thought that was pretty interesting. They produce artichokes. They're well known for their porcinis, for their, uh, for their mushrooms um, and white truffles. So white truffles is a huge delicacy throughout Italy. You might be more familiar with the black truffles from France. Uh, very similar, it's also uh, the same type of fungus, just a different variety. And the white truffle from Italy has a more slightly more delicate, more elegant flavor than the black truffle, which is quite pungent and powerful. Uh, Tuscany and Piemont are very well known for their white truffles, but actually there's a higher, there's much more production coming out of Abruzzo uh, of, of high quality as well. Um, and then in terms of meat dishes, so mutton is one of the major meats eaten here, lamb. And they have uh, one of the recipes that's really popular is called arrosticini. So it's skewers of lamb roasted over an open fire. And agnello cacie oro is a lamb stew cooked with wine and eggs and cheese. I'm gonna look up some of these recipes and see if I can send you a couple of links afterwards because they just sound amazing. And obviously these are the typical, the classic pairings in the area, as I said, with the local wines. Um, they also, obviously we have 150 kilometers of Adriatic coastline here. So there's an abundance of fish and seafood. And one of the most popular dishes there is called brodetto. And it's a fish stew with a uh, mix with mussels in it. That's quite hearty and flavorful, cooked in wine. Sounds amazing. Uh, they're also well known for pasta, for their pasta production. Uh, and in an area on the slopes of the Mayela Mountains, there is uh, the River Verde. So it's uh, water flowing down from these mountains, considered to be very, very pure. And the quality of the pasta from this area is considered to be apparently among the best pastas in Italy. Uh, there's also a wealth of cheeses. Pecorino, as I mentioned earlier, is a cheese from Abruzzo, as along with a lot of different sheep uh, ricottas, 
and all sorts of different types of mozzarella. And then they're also known for their desserts, especially sugared almonds and a nougat called toroni. So really a wealth. This is an amazing place to go and eat. And as I mentioned, it's only a two hour drive. It's 100 kilometers from Rome obviously the largest, most important airport in, um, in Italy, and just fabulous walking to be done, walking from beautiful medieval village to beautiful medieval village while sampling all of these delicious foods, drinking the wines. You really can't, can't get much better than that. And what's great about it is because it is less well known than you know, some of these very famous areas like the Veneto or Piemont or Tuscany, the prices remain very affordable for, uh, for the B&Bs and for the restaurants of the area. So obviously we can't, boy, we can't really travel very much at the moment. We're traveling vicariously through stories we're sharing through the videos I put on beforehand, but hopefully in the, hopefully the not too distant future, That's we'll be back day. out there. And I definitely highly recommend going to Abruzzo and definitely picking up some of these wines because they really are, uh, as I said, just the quality is, is skyrocketing at the moment. They're still really affordable. They're very approachable wine styles. I've never poured a multiple Chiano or a Trebbiano for somebody who didn't like it. So I highly recommend giving them a go. And even if you don't want to cook up uh, a very complex and, and impressive lamb stew, even just with a slice of pizza or a pasta with a tomato sauce. These wines really go great. And Jackie, if you find that recipe and share it, I promise I'll do a video for the members of me cooking oh. it. And, ah, okay. Yeah, and we'll pair it with some of the Opimian wines that are available in C286. So, All right, everybody, that, you heard it. Yeah, Michael's going right. to do a cooking video for you. I'm going to hold him to it. Yeah. So are there any other questions about the area, about the region, or just about wine in general? Any burning questions you've had, I'd be very happy to answer them. If you've been there, Jackie, Paul is asking if there's a town that you'd recommend staying in if you're going to experience the whole region. Pescara is very nice because it's on the coast. Um, so if you wanted uh, a little bit of sun, uh, that's a really nice uh, area to go to, and it's, it's quite quick to get into the interior. Aquila, as I mentioned, was very lovely, but infrastructure is still a bit complicated. I mean, the earthquake was back in 2009, but it's it's still uh, improving, but still a bit complex. And then around Chieti is quite nice as well. The whole Colitiatini area is very, very nice. But... And then Michelle has has asked about uh, good things about, I'm not going to, I'm not going gonna, gonna to butcher this, Michelle. Chukukukalot. Can you read that, uh, Jackie? Oh, you <laughs> know what? The, in, I'm going to stop you... sharing the screen yeah, and we can right. see everybody and then I can read the chat because I can see it, but I will look down. Uh, and I think this is Michelle telling Paul this is where he should stay. Yes. Oh, no. So uh, Cocciola uh, is is another one of the, the white grape varieties, but it's very, very, there's very, very little to be had. It is a very, very nice grape. It does have a lovely fragrance and a lovely smooth body to it, but it's it's very hard to unfortunately come by um, here in, in Canada. Most of it, as I say, yeah, tough to get in Canada. Most of it is drunk locally. Mm -hmm. And any other questions? Was that your last slide, Jackie? That was, yeah. I just right. well, wanted good. to give you a great overview of, uh, of Montreal Channel, what it's all about. But I, I have learned a lot and I did want to tie it into uh, Cellar 286. I, I, when, I, when I took my camera off, I actually went and picked up my seller offering that we're currently in because it's got all the list of all the, the seller offerings. And, and C286 is from June 7th to July 11th. And Abruzzo will be in that offering. And some of you will be familiar with this. And in fact, I had some Pimo here in the house. I went looking for that too. And I don't have it, but we bought, got both the Montepulciano and as well as the Pecorino in the Pimo that will, and more than likely coming back, they haven't been tasted by our masters of wine yet. Uh, so, and as all of our members know, it has to pass muster with them first before it's offered in the catalog, but uh, it's come back year after year. So I think that it'll certainly make it. And then also we've got the Dea del Mara, um, multiple to Chiano. How did I do? Not too bad. Yes, and that, that, that actually great. means a goddess of the sea, which, and, and I've tried those wines and they are excellent. They're huge value. Like they are so inexpensive yep. for, for their quality. And that's the so thing. That, I think it's really the sweet spot for Abruzzo at the moment, because as I said, there's just this really, there's a, a few pioneers out there that for the last 20 years have been leading this quality revolution and everybody else has been swept up in the movement. Um, but the prices have remained very, very affordable. 
Yeah, and, and, and Paul had asked that question that I just answered, right, Paul? So that's good. And, uh, and the, the rosé, yeah, the rosé, the, all of the Dia del Mar are, are not all from Abuzzo, but, uh, but they were really good and they've come back year after year after year. I, I love their sparkling. It's, uh, it's one of my go-to. Those of you who come to Opinion events or used to before COVID at my house, they'd always get a glass of that as they arrived. So, so that's very good. Um, so if anybody else has any other questions here, um, and are you seeing that, Jackie? Michelle's uh, talking again about... Uh, yeah, about Tera, uh, Teramo is also, yes. yeah, the, it, it's lovely. And the whole the whole province is really, of, the, of Teramo is lovely. But again, yeah, there was, there was something like a, a thousand aftershocks to this earthquake, and it just really mm. rippled through the entire through the entire region and uh, caused quite a yeah. lot of devastation. Well, Anna, Anais and I are working really hard on a, a French trip for the spring in May. And then we, we plan to do Italy in the fall. Again, this is all depending on what COVID decides to do. Well, but, now you know uh, where to go and stay well, in Italy. <laughs> and you know what? We, we do these virtual tastings. And, and whenever we do that, uh, Anais and I say, oh, we should go there. Oh, we should go there. Yeah. So, and I think we'd have to do like four weeks of Italy if we're going to get it all in, right? So, so and, and we'll, we'll do something. And, and this certainly does make this look very attractive. So we'll have oh, to really do is. that. Yeah. It really is. Take your, take your hiking boots. There's some yeah. lovely walks to be had. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, look at those pictures you showed and, and the, the video. It's just gorgeous. Yeah, and it really is. Who wouldn't want to go? Right. <laughs> That's, and who wouldn't want to drink these wines? I mean, it's, it's just terrific. So, so thank you very much, Jackie. And thank you, Annie, for running the board as usual. And, uh, and thank you, all of you. This is one of the biggest we've ever had. Um, and it's so wonderful, as I say, for us to get together as a group and, and uh, share the joy of wine and, and to share. Oh, the draw. Thank you, Anais. I just got it. <laughs> I was about that, to mention if she didn't. <laughs> yes, that's right. So, so you had to have been here to win. So you, I think we, were, we topped out at about 104 screens. And so you've got a one in, a, no, a three in 104 chance of winning a $100 uh, wine credit that you can use during 286 to buy one of the Abruzzo wines. So, uh, so stay tuned. We're going to draw that on Monday, and we'll do it fairly. We promise. We we found a, a program online that that uh, chooses the winner. So uh, those three people will be informed next week uh, of having won that, and we'll get that wine credit out to you. And that is uh, thanks to to your partners, Jackie. Uh, at the consortio for, for de Vini Abruzzo. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So thank you to them for, for having provided uh, that that to us. And and it's it's just another way that uh, that we can do these these things and, and enjoy. Uh, I'm I'm losing the words. It's just so it's so cool. <laughs> and thank you, Jackie. Like I, I I always say this, and I'm sorry everybody who's heard this before, but I've got the best job in the world. I get to talk <laughs> to masters of wine all day, and I saw that. That Louise is on. Thanks for joining us, Louise. Yeah, and, thank you, Louise. Nice. Yeah, it, it's it's just such a such a great thing. And I see Pablo. Hi, Pablo. It's been so long. I thought I should single you out and say hello. It's good to see you, man, and uh, and look forward to being able to see all of you in person one of these days. So so thank you, everybody. Anything else, Jackie? You want to say? No, I just thank you. Up? I'm seeing some of these lovely comments come up in the chat, and uh, I'm just really pleased that you enjoyed yourself. And I uh, hope to do it again. Let's do it again. That's right. Uh, which region do you want to do next, Jackie? <laughs> so many. I'm going to get That's back to right. a long list. <laughs> oh, so true. Thanks, everybody. Look forward to seeing you again. Enjoy good, your weekend. Good evening. Good afternoon. Bye-bye.